Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and also I would like to thank the organizers of this nice event for inviting me and also for the opportunity to speak immediately after Rudolf Haag, which is of course a great challenge. <coughs> Now, actually, I want to speak about a subject which uh, was for a long time a little bit neglected in the community of algebraic quantum field theory, namely about the perturbative approach to quantum field theory. And I want to speak about the relations of the algebraic approach to these perturbative uh, methods. And this is based on several papers written in collaboration with Romeo Brunetti Michael Dutsch and Petro Lauritzen Ribeiro. Now the plan of the talk is the following. After an introduction, I want to explain the algebraic structure of perturbative free normalization as we see it at the moment. And this is based on, the, uh, uh, on a method which uses uh, interactions which are localized in a compact region of space-time. This makes the algebraic relation simple, but at the end you have to remove the space-time cutoff, and this uh, is the so-called adiabatic limit, and I will describe how this adiabatic limit can be performed in the algebraic framework. And I will end with some conclusions and some outlook. Now, as we already heard in the talk of Rudolf Haag, uh, quantum field theory is just quantum theory and uh, together with the principle of locality and the principle of locality has of course to be implemented in some way and the way it's implemented is by uh, the um, concept of the local algebras of observables which are associated to regions of space-time. And because <coughs> uh, the, uh, the causal relations in space-time and the algebraic relations in the algebra are closely related, uh, this was a relation between the algebra and its commutant and the region and its space-like complement. Uh, the um, algebraic and geometric structures are very near to each other. And so there are two different names for this framework, namely one is algebraic quantum field theory, it's the name of this conference and also the name of our group in Hamburg. And what is uh, synonymous is local quantum physics. So this em emphasizes more the, uh, the relation to locality, not so much the algebraic relation, but due to the properties of quantum physics, both concepts are actually lead to the same structure. Now, the algebraic approach of quantum field theory uh, was very successful in the axiomatic formulation. The reason is that you start from very clear physical principles. You can use rigorous mathematics, the mathematics of operator algebras, and you get a structure which is a qualitative agreement with the structure of particle physics which we observe in experiments. <coughs> and uh, Rudolf in his talk already reported on the main successes of this approach. Let me just uh, remind you on this. So it started with the uh, explanation of the multiparticle structure of quantum field theory. Um, <coughs> and uh, this is remarkable because uh, you see that particles in quantum field theory are not fundamental quantities, but they are derived entities and they are derived from certain properties of local quantum physics, namely, you need the existence of single particle sp states uh, defined as eigenstates of the mass operator. You need local commutativity of observables. This could be uh, weakened a little bit, but uh, essential. so this is the essential structure behind this. And you need the fact that space time is homogeneous, so you have translation invariance. And this is the reason why we observe multi-particle states in quantum field theory, and this is in complete agreement with our finding from experiments. But it's, it's, it's based on these uh, structural properties. 
Now, another main success of algebraic quantum field theory was the analysis of the structure of super selection sectors and the discovery that this is just a dual object to the uh, set of inner symmetries, which are in the standard case uh, group. And another of these successes is the explanation of the origin of particle statistics. <coughs> and uh, this was also mentioned in Rudolf's talk, the uh, concept of thermal equilibrium states for, for infinite systems and the associated modular structure and uh, all what comes uh, follows from this. Now, algebraic quantum field theory was less successful in the construction of models. So, as, as any axiomatic scheme, you need a lot of examples, of interesting examples, where these axioms are fulfilled. Now, what are these known examples where the axioms are fulfilled? They are, first of all, free fields. Now, free fields, I think physicists uh, usually uh, uh, classify, uh, qualify uh, free fields as uninteresting or trivial. I think from the mathematical point of view this is completely wrong. These are highly complicated, interesting theories with a lot of internal structure and it's really worthwhile to analyze them and you, there's also a lot of physics in them. So one should not uh, say this, uh, just neglect what one can. Yeah? This is, one can analyze them and they are interesting. But there are also some other models which one can construct. So first of all, uh, by using methods of constructive quantum field theory, one can construct certain super renormalizable models and for them to construct also the algebras of observables. This is mainly the work of Glim and Jaffe. Then one can use the uh, conformal symmetry and two space-time dimension and this gives already s such a restrictive structure that one can use this structure to find a lot of interesting models. These are conformal nets in two dimensions and uh, here I want particular mention the work of Kawaigashi, Longo and Rehren. And more recently there has also been this construction, rigorous construction of integrable models in two dimensions by Lechner. So this is already a large family of interesting examples which one can analyze. Unfortunately, the examples we would like to analyze, namely interacting models in four space-time dimensions, or better, models which really describe uh, what we see in elementary particle physics like the standard model or say just QCD, this is still not possible to construct in this frame. Now, actually quantum field the theory can say a lot about elementary particle physics and this is due to developments in quantum field theory which were somewhat separate from algebraic quantum field theory. So I mentioned a few of them, so perhaps most important this is uh, perturbative renormalization and an understanding of perturbative renormalization led to the concept of the renormalization group which led them to an improved uh, perturbative formulation of the theory. Then another very uh, important structural element is the possibility to do a Wick rotation so you go from Minkowski space to a Euclidean space and quantum kind of field theory becomes a statistical mechanics so you can use techniques from statistical mechanics to analyze quantum field theory. Then another um, important uh, uh, thing is the relation to classical field theory, which, uh, okay, there are uh, successes and also uh, things which were perhaps not as successful as originally hoped, like the concept of instantons. Then very important, the concept of anomalies, which uh, we can directly see in the spectrum of elementary particles and the concept of asymptotic freedom which explains why QCD is a good candidate for the strong interactions. And as a, on a more technical side, there's the use of the path integral which is a very elegant way of formulating quantum field theory and uh, is uh, widely used. 
Okay, now, so if one looks at all these, uh, uh, all these items, one can ask uh, the following questions. So one question is, what is the relation of algebraic quantum field theory, which is well founded in fundamental principles, to these other formulations of quantum field theory? Second question, can algebraic field theory be reformulated in a form such that these perturbative and semi-classical techniques can be applied? And third question, if we are successful in doing this, will this contribute to general field theory? Okay, now actually there has already been some work in the past which deals with this problem. Unfortunately, this work has not had not much impact neither on, say, the real world outside of algebraic quantum field theory nor on the world inside quantum field theory. But uh, it was re very important for, for our investigations and I think these are really nice works. So I want to mention the work of Epstein and Glaser on renormalization. So what is the idea of the Epstein-Glaser renormalization? The idea is that you, the, uh, if you want to introduce interactions, you have to define what time-ordered products of fields are. And you can use just uh, locality <coughs> properties to define inductively the time-ordered products. And uh, the, the, there's some ambiguity in this uh, definition, but these ambiguities just uh, are characterized by the well-known uh, renormal renormalization conditions, which you have to fix anyhow. And this uh, way of uh, doing renormalized perturbation theory has a lot of advantages. It's uh, mathematically rigorous. It starts from very clear concepts. You get an explicit formula for the interacting fields expressed in terms of formal power series of free fields. Unfortunately, um, it's not so easy in this um, approach to formulate gauge theories. I will come to this point later. And there's also this problem that this, uh, this approach emphasizes the local properties, so it's important that the interactions are uh, restricted to compact space-time regions and at the end you have to remove the space-time cutoff and then you may run into problems, for instance infrared problems and so on. And there is one disadvantage which is the uh, consequence of the advantage that in this approach there are no, di no divergences but uh, the analysis of divergences led to the concept of the renormalization group. Here there are no divergences, so where is the renormalization group? And in particular, where are the insights which were gained by the renormalization group? Uh, another work I want to mention is the work of Steinmann. This is an inductive construction of retarded products. This can also be done. And a direct construction of Whiteman functions. Now, if we analyze this, I think this was more or less done <coughs> at the same time at Epstein and Glaser, yeah, that's... Hmm? Yeah, so, so it's essentially equivalent, but it has the advantage that the, uh, no space-time cutoff uh, is introduced, but on the other hand, this also makes the formalism more complicated because you're uh, have always to prove that certain quantities exist and in case you have infrared problems you cannot directly use it. Okay, now I come to uh, a new question which arose in the 80s and 90s with the increasing interest in the uh, relation of quantum field theory and gravity. Namely, if one for the moment uh, uh, accept that gravity is just uh, uh, a force which, which uh, modifies the space-time geometry, then you can ask what is the behavior of a quantum field theory on a given Lorentzian manifold. And when you try to formulate quantum field theory in such a space-time, you have to find an, a, 
uh, improved incorporation of the principle of locality. Now, on the axiomatic side, this is not terribly complicated. Of course, there are problems, but uh, um, they seem to be rather, rather uh, easily solvable. But when you try to do perturbation theory in the conventional sense, then you meet a lot of problems. And I listed here just the problems you have. Namely, you start, oh, you start with the inside that there is no distinguished state which one might call the vacuum in the generic case. Then the basic concept in quantum field theory and relating it to elementary particle physics is absent. There is no invariant concept of a particle. And as a consequence, you cannot, in the generic case, formulate the S matrix. So if you say the aim of quantum field theory is the computation of the S matrix, then this becomes meaningless on a generic Lorentz in space time. And then uh, if you come to practical calculations, you want to calculate Feynman graphs, then you see that you don't know what the Feynman propagator is because the Feynman propagator is defined as a time ordered, uh, the, the expectation value of the time ordered product uh, of uh, is the vacuum expectation value of the time order product of fields. Now, in the first moment, you could believe that the path integral might be a solution of the problem, because if you write down the path integral naively, it looks as, uh, as if it were um, ge uh, generally covariant, because you have an action which is generally covariant, you integrate formally over all values of the field. This is also a generally covariant notion. So uh, one might hope that this is the basis for a generally covariant approach. But if you really try to define this, this is of course purely formal. If you want to try to give a definition what this means, you can, for instance, give a definition in perturbation theory. So you split your action into a free part and an interacting part, and the free part is quadratic in the field, so you interpret this, the path integral as a Gaussian integral. But in the, the Gaussian integral is characterized by a covariance, and this covariance is just the Feynman propagator. So you are back to the problem before that there is no distinguished Feynman propagator. And uh, furthermore, the technique which is very popular in quantum field theory is that you just uh, uh, avoid the, the negative uh, coefficient in front of the Minkowski metric and you compute everything in Euclidean space. This does not work on a generic Lorentz in space time just because there is no uh, Riemannian space which is related to a generic Lorentz in space time. So the program one has to, to, to uh, uh, fulfill is one has to uh, eliminate all these known local features from in the foundation of the theory. And actually this was done and this is I think a, a part started which led to the concept of the micro local spectrum condition which was also already mentioned in the talk of Rudolf Haag which just is a local using techniques of microlocal analysis, which characterizes that locally the energy is positive. And this work had immediate consequences. First, there was a paper by Brunetti, oh, by Brunetti Köhler and myself, uh, where we could use these techniques to construct the, the composite fields associated to free fields. So uh, the, the, the Wick polynomials of the free field before only the expectation values of these fields were known. But using these techniques, one could also calculate all correlation functions of these objects, for instance, of the energy momentum tensor. Second, using now these techniques together with the uh, method of the Epstein-Glaser renormalization, one could perform the renormalization on a fixed globally hyperbolic space time. This was work by Brunetti and myself in 2000. Unfortunately, there was one uh, big gap which remained. Namely, this was 
uh, that these renormalization conditions, which one had to, to use to, to fix the theory, were functions of space-time. So at every different point, you could formulate the uh, renormalization condition independently. Of course, this is uh, not very nice, and um, but so one would like to use some symmetry to connecting the renormalization conditions at different places, but on a fixed uh, globally hyperbolic space-time in the generic case, there is no isometry, so it's not possible to make this, uh, um, to, to formulate this condition. So how can this be done? And this was solved a little bit later by, this is a, was a second step, namely the introduction of a new principle, the principle of local covariance. Actually, the birth of this principle was uh, uh, meeting in Oberwolfach, where most of these authors were present, and I think also some of the other participants of this meeting had some contribution to this. <coughs> so this uh, arose from discussions there. And what is the idea? The idea is that one should look not at a single globally hyperbolic space-time, but at all globally hyperbolic space-times. And so in the, in the, in the Haar-Kastler framework of uh, algebraic quantum field theory, you have a space-time and you have sub-regions of the space-time. Here you have just sub-regions considered to be space-times in their own right, and you have embeddings of one space-time into another space-time. And these embeddings should respect the metric, so they should be isometric, and also some causality relations which I don't <laughs> mention here. <coughs> and so, so instead of having a net on this directed set of, of, uh, of sub-regions, we have a functor from the category of space-times to the category of CSR algebras. This is a, a say, very straightforward extension of the original Haar-Kastler framework. And the nice thing is that on, in this extended framework, one has now a, a concept which generalizes the concept of symmetry. The concept of symmetry for, for um, fixed generic space-time is empty. But if you have the family of all space-times, you can use as a concept the concept of natural transformations. So you have natural transformations between different functors, and uh, I don't want to go into the, the details, just explain the concept of a locally covariant field. What is a locally covariant field? A locally covariant field is just a family of fields for each space-time, m, you have a field phi m, and if chi is an embedding of m, the space-time m, into the space-time n, and alpha chi is just the corresponding embedding of the algebra of observables a of m into the algebra of observables a of n, then these fields phi n and phi m should be related by this formula. So the field phi n at the image of the point x under chi is just phi m of x transformed with this endomorphism, with, with this um, um, homomorphism alpha chi. <laughs> and uh, if you see this relation and uh, look at the situation, say, in Minkowski space, these embeddings could just be Poincaré transformations, then this is just the transformation law for a scalar field. And of course, instead of scalar fields, you can have vector fields or spinor fields or so on. So this is uh, this concept of a local co uh, covariant field. And then, using this concept, uh, Stefan Hollands and Bob Ward were able to complete this program of co uh, renormalization by making it generally covariant. And they could also introduce in this framework now the concept of a renormalization group. Actually, there are this concept contained a lot of new interesting things which were relevant also for the theory on Minkowski space. And this was then analyzed in papers by, oh, by Dutch and myself and by, no, a recent paper by Brunetti, Dutch and myself. 
and led to some new insights in the, to the structure of the renormalization group. Now, uh, actually, as was mentioned in Rudolf Haag's talk, that not much was done on gauge theories. Actually, fortunately, this is not completely true. Recently, there was done something. So first, perhaps one should mention the work of Dutch, Scharf, and other people from, from Zurich on the uh, um, formulation of gauge theories using the Epstein-Glaser techniques. <coughs> But this was still not in the uh, framework of algebraic quantum field theory. Then there was a paper by Michael Dutch and myself on uh, the formu local formulation of gauge theories. And there were other papers by Dutch and Brennecke, Dutch and Boas on this problem. And finally, there was a very important paper by Stefan Hollands on the uh, formulation, perturbative formulation of gauge theories on generic Lorentzian space time, which involved all the techniques known in perturbative gauge theories like BIS structures, butterlin wilkowski structures, and so on. So here we see that the algebraic formulation is completely, has completely incorporated the uh, methods from perturbation theory. <coughs> Another point I only want to mention briefly is the operator product expansion. So the, in the axiomatic uh, framework, this was uh, analyzed by Bostelmann recently, and that it can be done in perturbation theory was uh, found by Hollands, and is now the basis of a new approach to, to the axiomatic characterization from field theory. I think we will hear about this uh, during this conference. Okay, so this was a rather long introduction, which was a survey on the past. Now, let me describe in more technical sense the algebraic structure of perturbative renormalization. And for simplicity, I restrict myself now to a scalar field on Minkowski space. Actually, it does not play an important role that we have Minkowski space because the framework is generally covariant but some explicit formulas are just taken for Minkowski space. Yeah? So it's easier to, to give explicit formulas if you fix your space time. And okay, so we start from the space of smooth field configurations, which we call E. And the, our observables are now just functionals, which values in the complex numbers, functionals on field configurations, is values in the complex numbers. Actually, we have no assumption uh, about the possible field configurations up to smoothness. So the behavior at infinity is completely arbitrary. This means that we are interested only in obs... Oh, these are just smooth functions. Just all smooth functions. We have smooth functions on our space-time. Just functions. <laughs> yeah? So, so maps from the Minkowski space to the complex numbers, and they, uh, all derivatives exist. This is the only assumption. This space is called E, and we interpret this as a space of field configurations. The observables are functionals now of these field configurations, and in order that these are well-defined functions, they should be restricted to having compact support. Compact support means that they depend only on the values of the field in a compact region of space-time. So in the same sense as you define a support of a distribution. Now, this is a linear space. Now on this linear space, we introduce a product, which we call the star product, which for, uh, motivated by the language of deformation quantization and the star product is defined in this way. So you uh, take this exponential series of diff functional differential operators, so this is the second functional derivative with respect to the field variables phi and phi prime and delta plus is just a two-point function in Minkowski space and this is just uh, uh, yeah, formally it's the integral of delta plus of x minus y, and here you have the functional derivative with respect to phi of x and phi prime of y. And, uh, and the result is again a functional, so you, at the end of the differentiation you 
you uh, set phi prime equal phi. Now, if you look at this formula, you see that this is nothing else than the formula for the multiplication of Wick products. It's just the Wick theorem. The only difference to the Wick theorem is that we don't assume that our fields satisfy the field equation, the free field equation. So this is, uh, but, but um, up to this, this is just the, the, the Wick theorem. Uh, we can also have a state on this, so we get, so we have made our, our uh, s linear space of functionals to a space, uh, to an algebra by introducing this product as an associative product. Actually, uh, le uh, here I should perhaps add an h bar, so this is, uh, I don't worry about the convergence of this sum, this is a formal series of differential operators. Now what is a vacuum? The vacuum is very simple, it's a linear functional on this uh, space and it's just the evaluation of this functional at the field configuration zero. Okay, now this is a free field theory. Now we want to introduce interactions. And the interactions, as I already said, uh, involve uh, that one has to define a time-ordered product. So let us look for first here at this formula. So the time-ordered product is defined very similar to the star product. The only difference is that you replace the two-point function delta plus by the Feynman propagator here. And because the Feynman propagator and the two-point function coincide, if the arguments are time-ordered, you get that the star product and the time-ordered product coincides if the support of this functional is later than the support of G, later in the sense of time in Minkowski space. Now, this time-ordered product has actually a nice structure. Namely, it's commutative because the Feynman propagator is, uh, is um, symmetric. It's associative. The proof is more or less the same as for the, for the star product. But it is even equivalent to the pointwise product. Yes, this, on the space of functionals, you have a, a natural pointwise product. And the time order product is actually equivalent to this to this pointwise product, and the equivalence is described here in this relation. You introduce a linear operator T, and the time ordered product is related to the pointwise product, which is de uh, denoted by this dot here, just in this way. And what is this time ordering operator capital T? Uh, defined here, it has again a structure as an infinite sum of functional differential operators. And if you analyze what this sum is, it's just the same as evaluating a Gaussian integral with a covariance delta f on this functional. Actually, it's not the evaluation of the integral, it's a convolution. You take a convolution of the Gaussian measure with, with the functional f, and that's the same as the application of this formal series. This holds, of course, in the sense of formal series. And, uh, of course, this is not really a measure. Uh, you can define it, it as a linear functional on polynomials, and um, in this way, you, you prove the, the equivalence of these two, two sides. So you see that the time-ordered product is directly related to a formal path integral. And now I come to the S-matrix. Now, the S-matrix in this sense is now not necessarily the scattering matrix. It's just a tool for computing higher-order time-ordered products. So it's the generating functional for time order products. So it's, but in this framework, it's nothing else than the exponential function computed via the time order product. But the time order product is equivalent to the pointwise product. So the time ordered exponential, the time ordered exponential is just the usual exponential uh, and uh, just uh, transformed by this operator T. Now, again, we look, what does it mean if we compare this with the formal path integral? Now, we evaluate, we apply S now to some interaction, V, and evaluate this in the vacuum state. So, by definition, this is the ev evaluation of S of V at the field configuration phi equals zero. 
but this is just the integral of the Gaussian measure with the exponential function of the potential. The only difference to the standard functional integral is that you here write not the potential itself but the normal ordered potential. Why the normal ordering? The normal ordering is just the effect of this t to the minus one. Yeah, so in this framework normal ordering is natural so you start from the normal ordered interaction and you get so this would be just the partition function in the language of uh, path integrals. But here, uh, of course, this relation to the right-hand side would involve some definition, but the left-hand side is completely well defined. Now, how can this uh, S matrix be used in order to define uh, the observables of the interacting theory? Now, for this purpose, you introduce something which uh, is corresponds to the Muller operators we know from scattering theory in, in, um, in quantum mechanics. Namely, we can introduce operators now from the space of f of, uh, of uh, our functionals into itself and these Muller operators are characterized by this intertwining relation which is written here. Yes? So you have the S matrix applied to F to the interaction V. You have the star product with this interacting field R index V of F. And this is defined to uh, be equal to the time ordered product of F sub V with the observable F. So the interacting observable corresponding to F under the interaction V is defined by this formula. And of course, S of V should be unitary, so you can invert this relation and just get the definition of L V of F. Now, to, to justify this definition, you could use different arguments. I just uh, present here one argument, namely, assume, look at the vacuum expectation value of the left-hand side. Now, uh, this is just uh, the product, the operator product of these two observables. Now assume that you are in a situation where, let's say, the, you remove the space-time cutoff, so the S matrix becomes a translation invariant. So, so in the limit, the S matrix maps the vacuum to the vacuum, at least in the case when the vacuum is unique. So assume that this holds, then the relation which is written here is just the gelman law formula for the interacting field. The vacuum expectation value of the interacting field is just the uh, functional integral of f div divided by the normalization factor. Yeah, so this is the correspondence. Okay, now I come to some important technical point. Namely, I have written all these functional derivative operators and contracted them with propagators. Now the propagators are distributions, so implicitly I assumed that these functional derivatives are smooth functions. But the observables we are interested in are local observables, and local observables are just polynomials in the fields integrated with test functions, but these are fields multiplied at the same space-time point, which is other. So if you take the functional derivative, you get delta functions of the differences. So they are not smooth. So the, uh, some of these expressions I wrote down are not well defined. So what to do? Now, uh, first of all, one has, uh, can use a nice characterization of local functionals by the additivity relation I wrote here. So, you, so, you, uh, so your functions are not, no longer linear, but they satisfy this kind of relation. So if I evaluate this function on a sum of three field configurations, then I can separate this in this form, provided the first and the third field configurations uh, um, have supports with empty intersection. And um, if you then uh, look on the behavior of the, of the functional derivatives, you can easily prove that the derivatives of the local functionals, higher order derivatives are distributions in several variables, and they have support now uh, 
only at coinciding points. We, uh, and the set of coinciding points in, in uh, n variables we call the thin diagonal. And I uh, use the letter D for this. Okay, now uh, the smoothness condition we still can impose on local functions is that the uh, remaining freedom, namely along the thin diagonal, is smooth. And this is, can be mathematically expressed by the property, oh, this does no longer work here. Uh, so this, is there some pointer? Uh, <coughs> oh. <laughs> There's also a true pointer. <laughs> yeah, the true pointer? Oh, yeah. uh, Even better. No, okay. <laughs> okay, so, so the condition is that the, the, uh, the uh, local functional is called smooth if, it de if its functional derivative exists as distributions whose wave front set is orthogonal to the tangent bundle of the diagonal. So this means that, that they are as smooth as possible uh, uh, for a local functional. Just as an example, so, so if you look at this local function, so this is just a field squared integrated with the test function f, it takes a second functional derivative, this is of this form, and the condition, smoothest condition is that this function f is smooth. And then one can prove two theorems. One is that now if you form the star product of local functionals and you can they generate a certain larger set of functionals. You can show that they produce uh, an associative star algebra. If you do the same for the time ordered products, the result is weaker. What you can then show is that the time ordered products exist under conditions of the support. Of course, this is related to the fact that the time ordered products coincides under certain conditions with the star product. And this generates a partial algebra. And actually, this is very nice because this can be used to do the epstein glaser renormalization also on a Euclidean space. And this was recent work by Keller. OK, now what is renormalization? Renormalization is the, in this framework, is just the extension of the S matrix to smooth local functionals. Yeah, at the beginning it was on the only defined on functions which have smooth uh, functional derivatives. Now we want to extend it to all smooth local functionals. Actually, this extension takes a very concrete form, and this perhaps should be emphasized. Namely, you can show that this S matrix is of the following form. You can expand it in a in a power series, so the nth order is just the nth order uh, time order product, and it takes the form of a functional derivative operator, actually a sum of functional derivative operators. Alpha is a multi-index. Delta alpha is just the uh, functional derivative, uh, non-linear functional derivative of nth order. So, so if you insert here n functionals f1 to fn, this is just this functional derivative of this product, and at the end you uh, set all phi i equal to phi. And what is S alpha? S alpha is a certain distribution which is formed from the Feynman propagator. And you can get a explicit representation if you just look at the usual graph expansion of the S matrix. And so you look at all graphs which have vertices 1 to n and with alpha, line, alpha i lines ending at the vertex i. Then this tensor product is a certain distribution. You have, of course, to say how this distribution acts on the right-hand side, but this is described by the incidence relations of the graph. <coughs> and there's some combinatorial factor which I did not compute here. And uh, so this is just, uh, this is a distribution. And S alpha is then an extension of this distribution to all uh, derivatives which can uh, exist on the right hand side. Yeah. 
now, uh, so of course, we have to apply this multifunctional differential operator to, to these smooth and local functionals. And what one finds, this is now the technical important point, one finds that the result is of the following form. You get a test function in n variable tensored by distributions in the relative variables. So at each vertex you separate your variables in center of mass and relative coordinates. And you have here the space of distribution with support zero in the corresponding uh, uh, number of uh, variables. This constitutes this uh, space V and the tensor product of D of M of, of the test function in N variables with V is just the space of possible uh, results of these functional derivatives. And so the aim is to define this coefficient as alpha as a linear functional on this, uh, on this space here. Now th what is the structure of this space? It has a natural grading, namely these are distribution with support zero. So uh, they are finite derivatives of the delta function. You, we just sum the number of derivatives and this gives the grading and so this uh, a vector space uh, can be decomposed as a direct sum. Now, one can use the main technique of epstein glaser renormalization, that the S matrix satisfies this condition of causal separation, that the S matrix uh, of uh, interactions which follow in time which other can just be multiplied. And this then leads to the fact that the S matrix in nth order is defined on the complement of the, of the thin diagonal by the lower order time ordered products, SK. Okay, now uh, maybe this is a little bit too technical to go to all details, just to indicate what one can do. One can just use the usual pow power counting, and then one can extend this S alpha as a linear map to this subspace, D omega, where d omega plus k on the right hand side is the space of test functions which vanish at order omega at the thin diagonal. Here, uh, this is maybe misleading. Uh, d, uh, this should be d omega plus k of mn here. Yeah, this is a set of test functions which vanish at a certain order and the direct sum, this is tensored with the k's grade uh, v, uh, of this space v, pk and this gives the space d omega. Okay, so this is a decomposition which you can do. So it's a little bit involved, but uh, not terribly complicated. And uh, now the rest is simple. How, do you, how can you do renormalization? Well, renormalization just means you already know that S alpha is defined <coughs> on this space. This is a subspace of D, and you just choose a projection. So 1 minus W is a projection from D to D omega, and the renormalized S matrix is just defined by the composition of these two maps. And all renormalizations of this form. This is the generic form of the renormalization. So we have reduced this ambiguity of renormalization to the choice of this single projection. Okay, and then one can prove the main theorem of renormalization, namely if you have two such choices of S matrix, then they are related by a map Z, which maps the set of smooth local functions into itself. And the crucial relation is this one here. And actually this Z has a similar structure than the S matrix. It's again an infinite sum of multi-differentiable operators. So I wrote the explicit formula here. This is Z applied to an interaction B is V plus this infinite sum, where Zn is now an n linear differential, op differential operator, similar to the S matrix. The only difference is that now this distribution Z alpha has support only on the thin diagonal. And this is the, has a consequence that this produces only local counter terms. So the only freedom you have in the choice of the S matrix is, uh, is uh, to add local counter terms in every order. And the set of all these maps form the renormalization group. And actually, if you look into the literature, this is exactly the renormalization group which was originally postulated by Petermann and Stückelberg. It's not the renormalization group 
one finds often in textbooks. So perhaps one should call it the Stückelberg Petermann renormalization group, but because they can't the name, perhaps it's fair to call this a renormalization group. Actually, it's really a group. So you can find uh, in many books the statement, unfortunately, they, uh, Stückelberg and Petermann called it a group. It's not unfortunate. It is a group, yeah? You can see it <laughs> explicitly from this formula. Mm. Uh, actually, this statement also proves that the other formulations are not equivalent yeah, to this. Okay, now I come to the adiabatic limit. Oh, I see I come to the end of my time. So, uh, so up to now, we have to restrict ourselves to interactions which are localized in a compact region of space-time. Now we want to do the adiabatic limit. How can this be done? No, we don't want to, introduce, uh, to, to discuss infrared problems, yeah? so it's just uh, we want to remain in this purely algebraic framework. So the first concept we introduce is the concept of a generalized Lagrangian. What is a generalized Lagrangian? Now the Lagrangian should be, should lead of course to an action, but we need an action with a space-time cutoff. So this is just the map L from the test function to smooth local functions with compact support. And this map should satisfy this additivity relation which we already know from our local functionals. Yeah, but now the entries are test functions. And, uh, and the nice fact is that the space of this generalized Lagrangian is invariant under the renormalization group. Actually, this, uh, it's not necessary that these maps L are not linear because the renormalization group is nonlinear. So it would then map linear functions into nonlinear functions, but the space of la generalized Lagrangians is invariant. Moreover, of course, different Lagrangians might lead to the same equations of motion. So we call two Lagrangians equivalent if the support of the difference uh, applied to some test function S is only localized where the uh, function F is not constant. And then one can show that the renormalization group also respects the equivalence classes. So if L is equivalent to L prime, then Z composed with L is equivalent to L prime. <coughs> Okay, now we want to construct the observables of the interacting theory. So we uh, use as a family which generates the algebra of observables, the generating function for time order products of the interacting observable. The interacting observable will be constructed with the use of these Muller operators. And the corresponding time ordered products of the interacting fields is just given by this product of S matrices written here. And now um, this is a relation which uh, follows from this causal factorization I mentioned before. One can show <coughs> that the dependence of this, oh, I, uh, yeah, okay, it's, uh, I sh should perhaps replace the R here by the S. It holds for both of them, but maybe it would be more logical to use here the S. So, so um, um, what holds is the following, if the two interactions V1 and V2 uh, coincide in the space-time region O, then the two observables associated to the observable F under this interaction V2 or V1 are equivalent in the sense there is the invertible element U in the algebra which, uh, which has this property. Here, here there should be the star product. So this shows that the algebraic relation of interacting fields see only the interaction in the same region, not the interaction in other regions. And then one can perform the adiabatic limit the following way. Namely, we look at all interactions which coincide with these uh, Lagrangian applied to a test function f in the complement of the region O if we insert the test function, a test function which is equal to 1 on O. And we use the fact that the algebraic structure in this region is independent of the choice of V. 
And then we get the algebra of observables just by looking at the family of all these operators. Yeah, so we index this family with the interaction in this set v of O. The algebraic relations are the same in all, uh, uh, in all fibers. And so this generates a, generates a well-defined algebra. Moreover, we find also the net structure and uh, also the functor, but uh, let's uh, stay for the, to the net structure at the moment. Namely, if the region O1 is contained in O2, then this corresponding space of interactions satisfies the opposite inclusion, just because the conditions are uh, weaker if the region becomes larger. And so we can find an embedding of the algebra of observables associated to the Lagrangian L in O1, to the algebra of observables associated to uh, Lagrangian L in O2, just by restricting this family to this uh, smaller set of interactions. And then at the end, we do what we always do in algebraic quantum field theory. We can perform the inductive limit and get the global algebra of observables of the, of the region. OK, now I wanted to say a few words on the action of the renormalization group on observable algebras. Namely, OK, maybe this is a little bit too complicated, but um, so we have an S matrix which is related to the original S matrix by a renormalization group transformation Z. We apply this now to this object, get this one, and then we easily see that the, the new observable here is related to the old one by replacing the interaction by the transformed interaction under the renormalization group and the observable F by a new observable which is just defined in this way here. And okay, maybe I skip uh, this point here. I just mention the, mention the, uh, uh, the result. So you find, using this construction, now an action of the renormalization group on the algebras of observables. And here I have written this, the explicit form. Yeah, you have this sequence here and you have this sequence here. And you can now use this structure to define an isomorphism between the nets associated to the Lagrangian. So you have the, using the prescription S hat, construct a net A hat index L, L is the Lagrangian, and you have an uh, S matrix S which produces a net A, but now with the transformed interaction Z composed with L, and the isomorphism is explicitly given by this formula. And this is just the algebraic form of the renormalization group equation. And uh, Okay, now you could apply this to, to uh, scaling. You can, algebraic field theory, can, you can do scaling just by scaling the regions, if you are in Minkowski space. You can scale your Lagrangian. You can scale the S matrix, if you take into account properly the dimensional parameters in the free action. And what you then find is just the central statement of uh, the Kelsen-Munzig equation, namely the scaled net is isomorphic to the net value uses classical scaling of the Lagrangian combined with the renormalization group transformation set of rho. Yeah, so, so in this sense, this is, um, gives just uh, the algebraic expression what is done by, that, by looking at small scales, you see a different Lagrangian uh, and you have an explicit formula for this. Okay, now I come to my conclusions. Actually, one can say a lot more, so, so let me just make a few remarks. So first of all, we have seen that we can construct nets of algebras observables for generic interactions in the sense of formal power series. We have seen that the renormalization group appears in a natural way as a group of isomorphisms of algebraic quantum field series. 
We have never met any infrared problem during the whole construction. So this can be done completely uh, uh, independent of any uh, infrared problem. And the choice of the vacuum played no role at all. So we could do it in a temperature state, we can do it in an arbitrary state as we like. And uh, so, so it does not depend on the choice of distinguished state. It's completely state independent. Moreover, this is not only an abstract construction, it's completely explicit. So this was the reason why I presented these details on these functional differential operators. These are completely explicit operations. You can use these graphical rules to write, to get bookkeeping of all these uh, calculations. It's completely explicit. And you are not forced to use the techniques of Epstein-Glaser, these techniques of di distribution splitting and so on, which Come, uh, become a little bit cumbersome in many practical applications. You can use any technique you want. Because uh, if, when you remember this formula for the renormalization, it was the, just the composition of this distribution as alpha with this projection. Now, if you regularize your distribution as alpha, you, you can uh, uh, you just lose, uh, look at a regularization which converges on this subspace to the, uh, uh, to the distribution as alpha. But uh, if it's regularized, you can then apply this 1 minus w to this operator and you can have 1, which is the unrenormalized uh, uh, S matrix, and you have S alpha combined with w, which is a counter term, which is local by the a property of W. Yes, so this, you can use any method of regularization you want and you just know from the beginning that this is a, a, a valid method. And in this way you can prove, for instance, that um, certain regularization methods lead to the correct results. And moreover, all structures are generally covariant and remain meaningful on globally hyperbolic space time. Okay, now let me also mention a few open question. So there was a big advantage that we don't have to use states. But of course there's also a disadvantage because you get no information on states by this method. So this information on states has to be done independently and the question is what can be done. And in the, of course in the Minkowski space a lot has been done. You only have to look into the corresponding papers, in particular those of Epstein, Glaser and Steinmann. But uh, for generic space times, not much is known. And uh, here I would like to mention a uh, new work of Da Piaci, Moretti and Pinamonti on using holographic ideas and I think we will also hear something about this during the conference. Another question one might ask is, uh, can the structural analysis of the axiomatic theory be applied to the perturbative setting? Now this is not so easily to be answered because um, in the axiomatic theory you use a full machinery of operator algebras but here you typically have formal power series and uh, it's not, not clear what the appropriate mathematical method is. But conceptually this should be possible and for instance one could try to use the buchholz ferch concept of an intrinsic renormalization group and compare it with the perturbative renormalization group I described. Another question is, uh, we, of course, we hope that we will not for all times live with this formal power series. So we would like to go beyond formal power series. Can we do this? Now for the classical field theory, which is uh, the limit h bar to zero of the whole formalism I described, this can be done and this uh, actually uh, involved some, some uh, uh, complications, but they have been solved recently and uh, Romeo Brunetti will talk about this. Yeah. It's true, yeah? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, one might hope uh, that one can do a similar analysis for finite loop order. So this would be zero loop order, so the classical limit of the theory, but in finite loop order you have a similar structure. So it could well be that it can be done in finite loop order and this would already be a lot. Okay, and the last remark is uh, we use the formalism for perturbation theory which is very general. So in particular we had not to assume that our, our uh, 
our um, Lagrangians are polynomials in the fields. And so we could apply this also to, for instance, to two-dimensional conformal theories, to integrable models, and even to quantum gravity. And the great question, which is largely open, is of course, will this improve our understanding of these models? Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very good talk, which takes a lot of digesting and things. Uh, we think we still have some time for a few questions in the remarks. I want to put the question on your last remark. It is very tempting to hope that you can apply this also the other models of space time, which are not the classical space time, but the quantum space time. Yeah. Be a first step towards quantum gravity. But either that way or any other way, one would guess naturally that you lose locality. Yeah. And isn't this a critical point? Because if I understand well, all this formalism is based on strict locality. It manifests through the Bogolubo formula or some other way. Yeah. Is there any hope to go beyond that? Okay, I would like to know. Um, <laughs> certainly it's true that the formalism as it, I described it relies on strict locality. This was really crucial for the argument. On the other hand, if you just look at the, 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 the form, explicit formula for renormalization, they perhaps can be uh, easily generalized to, to, to other situations because this was the structure of these multi-differentiable operators and the renormalization group had a prescribed structure. So, so you could perhaps think of doing renormalization in such a way that you say, well, you, I want to define these uh, functional derivative operators. There's some ambiguity, and the ambiguity should, be, should have a certain form, which you define to be local. Yeah? For instance, you say it can be expressed in terms of, say, star product of fields. Yeah, so, so there is some way of, uh, uh, of calling something local on non commutative space-time. You could use this definition. Actually, I think if you look at this work of um, uh, Grosse and Wolkenhaar, probably that's the way they formulate renormalizability. Of course, they restrict this further. They only uh, allow counter terms which are of the same form as the terms already appearing in the action. Here I would admit, in principle, all local counter terms. Yeah? Uh, you pointed out uh, that formally your expressions coincide with, what, uh, with, with pass integral. Yeah. But did you ever exploit this fact, or did you translate uh, the, the, uh, the later steps to the language of pass integral so that one could better understand what is going on uh, okay. in renormalization of pass integrals? Um, Okay, so in a technical sense, the path integral is nowhere used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you want to understand, for instance, what people do uh, which use these renormalization group flow equations, then you can use just this language. So, so you can use these formulas I wrote down to, to, to uh, make a dictionary. So they have this flow of renormalization uh, constants. And you can directly, so they, they call uh, something the integration out, integrating out degrees of freedom. This is in this framework just uh, uh, expressed in terms of these, uh, these S matrices. So the S matrix here, um, okay, this, yeah. So, so if you have, if you introduce some regularization of your time ordered product, say a regularization of the Feynman propagator, you would get a regularized S matrix. And the application of this operator um, could be called the integrating out of freedom for these variables. And in terms of this, you can then derive the flow equation. So this operator satisfies the flow equation which is used in this uh, renormalization method. Yeah, how does the distinction between renormalizable and non-renormalizable theories arise? Yeah. Okay, it arises in the following way. Here, uh, 
uh, given a Lagrangian, you can reach all other Lagrangians which are in the orbit of the renormalization group. So renormalization group acts on the space of Lagrangians and you get all the full orbit. And renormalizable theories have the properties that the orbit is finite dimensional. Can you comment on the problem with gauge theory? Oh, yeah. Um, um, so, so um, yeah. When, when you introduce gauge theories, yeah, th 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 you, um, the one step is easy. You, you introduce some gauge fixing, and then you are just in the framework, you can do the same, completely the same analysis. But of course, you have to go back. Yeah, you, because you, and this is described by the BIS formalism. And so what you have to prove in addition is that by using these, uh, introducing these interactions, the BIS transformation transforms in the appropriate way so that the theory remains BIS invariant. This is actually rather complicated and this was the work I mentioned of Stefan Hollands who proved this in general, uh, in general form. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you, you have to, 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 uh, to, to enlarge your system, you have not only the gauge fields, you have also the Fadeev pop of gauss and, and uh, so you get, a, get a, la a rather large framework with a lot of redundant fields, but in this algebraic framework this does not uh, do any harm. You can just do, do every step. Uh, actually, there's one, one point where one has to be cautious. Here, this relies heavily on the fact that the classical field equation has a well-posed Cauchy problem. This is not true for all choices of gauge conditions. And so it's not clear whether for other choices of the gauge conditions the, uh, the, this formalism can be applied to, to curved space-time. Because on Minkowski space the situation is better, but on a curved space-time you are in trouble if the Cauchy problem is no longer well-posed. And then, for instance, you need this uh, Hermander theorem of propagation of singularities. And, so, and if you use these, uh, uh, so for instance, other gauges than the Feynman gauge, then it's not clear that, that this can be done properly. There are, there are the nice proof of renormalizability, which you will uh, equations, the equation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, it's actually this is uh, just just the following. You you you. Okay. Try all oh. six of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so, so, so um, I described this uh, relation of the S-matrix to the path integral. And this actually, uh, I also, uh, so we introduced some, some cut-off lambda or more generally some regularization of the Feynman propagator. And this leads to a time-ordered exponential which is more regular. Yeah? And now uh, what is the, the uh, flow equation? This is just that you, let me see, um, you can compose now operators like this. Yeah? You take two different scales and you look at these operators. If you write this explicitly, yeah, this is T lambda, the exponential function, T lambda to the minus one, the lambda prime, um, here you have the logarithm, and here, here you have t lambda prime to the minus one, yes? This are operators like this. Now this is just what one, okay, maybe I did the order in the wrong way, perhaps I should write the inverse on the left-hand side. Yes, so, so, so you have this path integral for restricted uh, for a restricted interval, namely between lambda prime and lambda, yeah, and and so, so you define the interacting potential as uh, the, the effective potential as as uh, 
I think that this was the correct formula. This would be the effective potential. And you can then look, the, uh, you, you look at the derivative with respect to the to lambda. And this is just a flow equation. Yeah. This gives a flow equation and you, then you can see that this flow equation can be integrated in perturbation theory. This is just Polshinsky's argument. And then they usually have to show that you can find a solution which satisfies certain boundary conditions. Here, in a sense, we are in a better situation because we already know the existence of the limit using the epstein glaser techniques because they don't exploit locality. So here we exploit locality and locality just gives that the solution exists and even can be classified the possible solutions. And, uh, um, and the, the so, so, so um, there they have to introduce these counter terms at hand, uh, uh, by hand and uh, in abstract glass we can compute the counter terms. Yeah, but, but uh, they can differ only by a finite renormalization group transformation. So you also have a group of renormalization Yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, uh, I, I'm a little bit prejudiced because I've done something on hypothetic theory in, in a very different context. So I was wondering if... In the, so usually you have the slow and fast degrees of freedom and the separation of scales. Yeah. Are scales the, the related by the uh, interact by the propagation speed? I mean, you you blow up the region, and it, in a way, you know, you could think of making the, the, the interaction more and more instantaneous. <laughs> so uh, the, the speed of light or whatever goes goes to or okay, no, no, here, here uh, the speed of light is fixed. So this is not, not, not used. Actually, in the, uh, if one only exploits locality, you don't need any cutoff. Yes, you, so you don't need this separation of degrees of freedom. But you could, in the, uh, in the way I sketched this here, you could introduce some, uh, some uh, decomposition and degrees of freedom and look at this behavior, for instance, of this effective potential I wrote there. But there's a problem. So, so I think these techniques are um, usually done in the Euclidean framework because there you have a good notion of what it does it mean to have restricted momentum. On Minkowski space this is not a good concept because it's not Lorentz invariant. And on a generic space time it's not clear at all what it means. Yeah. So, 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 but, but uh, once you introduce some kind of regularization, you always get this structure. So this is it's not important that this is just a cutoff in momentum. Could, for instance, you could use it in dimensional regularization. So this is just the deviation of the dimension from four. Yeah. So, so there are a lot of uh, possible techniques you could apply, and you always get the same uh, the same functional equation. But why is it called adiabatic? No, no, uh, the adiabatic means, uh, means no, no, the, uh, the, this is a misunderstanding. The, the renormalization is only in the ultraviolet. There's no infrared renormalization here. The renormalization is only, uh, so the adiabatic limit only means that you get a theory which is, which, where the interaction is uh, the same in all space time. Yeah, it's. Um, so, so we don't analyze in this method the behavior of states at infinity. This has to be done independently. This is not analyzed here. Okay, I think we should close the discussion at this point. Do something. Down uh, next to the toilets, there's uh, a locker.